Hi there, History Community. Uh, I'm Robin Bates. I'm here with Haley Bowen, who has been so wonderful to join the department as a assistant professor this year. And I'm just going to ask her a few questions today to kind of get us um, into her scholarship. So Haley, welcome. Thank you so much, Robin, for having me. I'm delighted to be able to talk to you and to the broader Northwestern community, too. So Haley, I know that you are a real expert on early modern French history. And I wanted to ask you, how did you come to this subject? Would you always have had this as a dream or how did you discover it? Um, in some ways, it was sort of a dream. I, I have some very embarrassing photos from when I was seven or eight where I dressed up as Elizabeth the First for Halloween. So I think there was a longer sort of trajectory there. But uh, I really became interested in European history um, when I was 18 year old, years old. I had the chance to go and live in Belgium for a year. And there was something about walking around um, the old part of Brussels and, and being in the presence of that architecture and being able to visit these museums that are there um, that really grabbed a hold of me and um, made me want to pursue the study of early modern Europe once I got back to college. So I had wonderful teachers along the way who really encouraged me. Um, my uh, senior thesis advisor at Harvard, Suzanne Smith, um, who was in the history and literature program, was really instrumental. She very much encouraged me to pursue a PhD in history. And I tried to do other things first, I have to say. I had a job. <laughs> I worked at a law firm for a little while. I worked in finance. And then um, I really, really missed the ability to pursue my own research questions and, um, and to sort of have more independence in my work. Work, and that was what really drove me back to the academy. Um, and I'm very lucky now to be here at Northwestern. So I went to uh, Michigan for my, my PhD, uh, worked with Dina Goodman there. Um, and now uh, here I am. So you mentioned pursuing your own research questions. And I know that a lot of these questions have drawn you into the history of religious communities, especially communities of religious women in early modern France. And as I've read your work, it's very interesting because you can read tons of sort of hyperbolically patriarchal statements from early modern France. But of course, these are communities, even though they're within that structure that are, you know, administered by and, and for women. And also that we have an idea perhaps that these are cloistered communities and in some extent, ritually they are. But you found that there's a ton of interaction between secular people and these cloistered communities. So I wonder how you would like to change our opinion of early modern <laughs> religious communities and what you think we learn about community by studying them. Wow, so that's a great question. So um, myself and a number of other scholars who work on monastic communities, particularly female monastic communities, have really been trying to change the public perception, the image of what um, these communities look like. Of course, we're operating in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries. Most of the communities I work on are cloistered spaces, which means that the nuns who live within them profess their lives to God and make a pledge never to leave the monastery again. So in a sense, their physical mobility is really limited. Um, but the flip side to that is that being in a community largely composed almost entirely of women, um, they have a lot of authority to lead lives the way they want to. And one of the things that has been really remarkable in the resurgence of scholarship on these communities is just how engaged convents were with the world beyond the walls of their convent. So they're really big financial players. They often own huge tracts of land outside of these urban centers where they're often located. Um, they might you know, effectively have um, thousands of tenant farmers. They have uh, huge sums of money at their disposal, which they invest into properties in the city. Um, and so they're real financial players in a lot of uh, cities in, in early modern France. Um, and the other uh, thing that my own work has really touched upon is that in this period of religious fervor, which we call the Catholic Reformation in particular, in the, in, you know, it has its heyday in France in the really in the 17th century, early 17th century, lots of lay women, secular women who don't take vows are entering the convent for temporary stays for their own their own purposes, which is going to be um, the, the subject of, of my forthcoming book. So we often think of, you know, convents as rather oppressive sites, and in some sense they were, but they often 
also afforded lots of opportunities to women to have huge amounts of power, um, both seigneurial power uh, and also economic power that they wouldn't often have been afforded in many other areas of early modern life. So they're really, really fascinating spaces to work with. You mentioned this book uh, that you are writing, uh, tentatively titled, I believe, Reaching the Cloister. Yes, that is that is the working title. <laughs> So can you give us kind of a sneak preview? What's the story this book is going to tell? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I'm very excited about this project and to keep developing it. So it takes place at this moment that we've been discussing, the Catholic Reformation. Um, and I really start in uh, the heyday of the Catholic Reformation in the 17th century, and I move into the 18th century. And what I'm looking at is how lay women, so these non-professed women, how they made use of the site of the cloister in a variety of ways. So um, I'm finding on the one hand that women often fled to the cloister as a site of refuge. So I have many, many instances of women in my research who go to the convent when they're threatened with domestic violence, for example. So they'll use the convent as a sort of sanctuary from some of the marital abuse that they're experiencing at home. And they stay with the nuns and nuns often support them in their, in their legal fights with their husband, for example, or provide them with other sorts of emotional care. And then they might return back home to their husbands or choose to stay in the convent uh, permanently as lay pensioners. Um, lots of other women came to the community at the end of their life in, in re retirement. So if they were left perhaps without family or they had very little income, they might pledge um, their remaining assets to the convent and then the convent would allow them to stay on as a lay pensioner and they would you know enjoy the care and hospitality of the nuns, um, benefit from the you know amazing medication that these communities could provide, the social community, um, and, you know, there's also a lot of women, of course, going to these locations for, for spiritual reasons, too. Um, they attend to the convent, uh, go to the convent for spiritual retreats, for example. So they're making really diverse use of these spaces. And um, one of the arguments of my book is that these are really important and hitherto sort of unexplored sites of feminine community. Lots and lots of elite women in particular in the 18th century were spending significant portions of their lives in convents, um, whether as children or in these later sort of scenarios that I've just, just laid out. Um, there's a flip side to that too, however, which makes the site even more complicated, which is that convents were also being used increasingly in the 18th century as sites of incarceration. So my book follows how certain convents in Paris, um, in, in uh, French colonies like New France and also in Martinique, um, how certain convents increasingly partnered with state officials, state bodies like the police, um, to uh, to effectively discipline women, to punish women in particular ways, often for sexual crimes, but also things like um, being a, pro a Protestant, which was you know illegal in France by the end of of the 17th century. So uh, one of the really shocking things that I've found in my research is that for a number of convents, uh, the main source of income that they had was housing incarcerated lay women, um, people who were placed in the convent for, for example, um, being an adulteress or being accused of prostitution or debauchery, which is a big kind of 18th century term, or um, Protestant women who the state wanted or the, the monarch wanted to convert to the uh, to the Catholic faith. So there are a lot of incarcerated lay women living alongside um, these other more voluntary pensioners who who have entered these communities. And the sort of complexity, it, it seems almost like an opposition and antagonism between these two functions of the convent as a sort of refuge and communal space for women, but also as a, a prison for women and particularly for fe like feminine crimes like adultery um uh adultery being you know, can't prosecute men really for adultery in, in the 18th century it's one of the unfortunate realities of the patriarchal regime in that period but anyways um so uh all of these women who end up in these communities for uh for these sort of feminized crimes um are living alongside uh many other kinds of women so they're really complex complex sites Wow, this sounds like a really great book. I, I look forward to seeing it uh, uh, in its completed form. 
I know that in addition to being a scholar, you're also very committed to teaching. And although you're just starting at Northwestern, you've already renovated our undergraduate curriculum quite a bit with <laughs> new courses on witches and monsters. So I want to ask you two questions about <laughs> teaching. One is when you're teaching about witches and monsters, and I would love to take these classes, uh, <laughs> how do you approach something that's so saturated with superstition and myth and make it into an object of social scientific inquiry? And then what's it been like introducing these topics to Northwestern students? What are your impressions of our students, um, even at this early stage? Well, these have both been really, really fun classes to teach. So the first um, course I taught here was um, a seminar on monsters and marvels in the early modern period, where I had a really great, very engaged group of 15 students um, who all wrote wonderful historiographic papers, which is a very challenging exercise uh, for an undergraduate. So I was extremely impressed. And I'll, I'll say a little more about that later, perhaps. But um, yeah, these courses are super interesting. Um, one of the sort of like conceits of both of these classes really is that our, our cultural fears tell us a lot about who we are, about um, the anxieties of the community in which we're residing. So um, one thing I try to do is actually invoke or really engage with all these stereotypes that we may have in our head about um, what monsters are, what witches are at the very start of the class. So I have an exercise which I've I've borrowed from um, from Val Kivelson at the University of Michigan, in which on the very first day of my witchcraft course, I have students take an index card and draw a picture of a witch. <laughs> and surprise, surprise, every single student draws a woman, which mm -hmm. is, you know, kind of if you're an early modern historian, uh, is really interesting because there were lots of male witches in the 17th century, and we don't often think of those when we think about witches. And a lot of the rest of the course is sort of about unpacking these myths about what a witch is um, over a long historical trajectory. So um, we look at this like sort of strange cultural facts, cultural icon that we all think we know really well, and then try to come up with a historical narrative that explains why in, in the early modern period at the height of the witch trials, 40,000 people were killed, were, were executed for what is essentially an imaginary crime, a crime that was created um, pretty much out of thin air, almost disconnected with, um, with actual sort of magical practices happening among the general early modern population, created almost out of thin air by these clerical figures in the, in the late 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. Um, so uh, kind of uncovering that paradox, the fact that we have, you know, on the one hand, no real historical evidence that witches ever met in covens. And on the other hand, um, thousands of documents testifying uh, to their existence under, you know, under threat of torture, of course. Um, that's a sort of really interesting historical puzzle to deal with. So what I try to do in my course is lead students through various explanations for why the witchcraft trials occurred um, at the time they did in the manner that they did. A lot of those have to do with um, with gender norms, um, with uh, religious um, proclivities among the population, with like legal foundations like the you know broad use of torture in the early modern period. So we try to come up with a picture that explains the sort of puzzling historical fact um, and then trace how the, the sort of iconography of the witch has shifted. One of the really fascinating and fun parts of the course is at the very end, we talk about public and um, popular receptions of the witch as a figure. And she's sort of, since the 70s, as our, as our cultural anxieties have shifted, of course, um, has become less of a frightening figure and more of a sort of feminist icon in many ways. Um, so she looks, you know, the, the modern witch, always gendered as she really in our modern imagination looks very different from the early modern witch. So we try to tra trace that as well. Um, the other thing, the other way I try to do this in the, in the monsters class, which is also e equally fun, um, was by having students uh, come into the course uh, using uh, like an AI um, uh, AI website to generate an image of a modern monster. What is the monster in their own life? And that sort of set us up as a foundation to talk about the ways in which um, the things we fear often are really revealing of our our broader anxieties, our broader social and economic and cultural identities. Um, so that's sort of the, the general approach I take. Um, Northwestern students have taken it in stride. I have to say, I've really, really enjoyed working here at Northwestern. The students are extremely engaged, um, just lovely to interact with. And as I mentioned before, have written really wonderful 
papers has been very impressive to see, um, you know, how quickly they're able to get a grasp on the basic subject material in very a very short amount of time. We only have, you know, eight or nine weeks and a quarter here. So they don't have much time to um, to get on their feet with a new topic. But um, so far, they've been really up to the challenge. So it's been it's been lovely to work with them. I think they're very lucky to have a teacher like you <laughs> taking the discipline in new areas. Um, Haley, thank you so much for sharing your, your scholarship and your teaching with us today. Thanks so much, Robin. It's been a pleasure.